morning, church. How y'all doing? Doing good? Oh, man, so good to be in the house this morning. We're going to worship. We're going to jump right in and go forth this morning today. Um, just want to say hello to our families at home. We love you guys. We're so glad that you are with us to worship this morning. While we stand together, I just wanted to read something that God was just speaking to me this morning in Psalm 100. Uh, I was just thinking about this idea of being thankful. And I've said this before, but I think as, as worshipers, the best place to start coming into the house or coming into the gathering, just coming into worship yourself is just to be thankful, to have a heart of thankfulness. This is Psalm 104. It says this, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. And I think that's just such a good reminder for us this morning that whatever you're carrying, as you walk through the doors, we can come in with thankfulness because God is good. He has not changed. Even over this past year, he is the same God. And he comes with uh, he comes with his faithfulness, he comes with righteousness, and he comes with his goodness, and he meets us right here in this place where we gather. So let's go with thanksgiving, let's go with praise, let's go together. Come on, church.
no more fear, God. We sing and roll the stone away. See the empty grave. We lift our hands and sing. Hallelujah. Roll the stone away. We see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. There's this amazing story in Second uh, Chronicles. As a worship leader, it's like one of the coolest stories in Scripture for me. Second uh, Chronicles 20, there's this scene where the Israelites are up against all these different armies that are coming to just slaughter them, essentially. And the Spirit of the Lord comes on this guy. Um, I forget what his name is. <laughs> Um, but uh, he's a Levite, and he's, he, the Spirit of the Lord tells him to say this to all these, these people, these armies that are standing there. He says, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army that you see in front of you, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And that's um, just such a good word. Um, just even... Stepping into the stepping into worship this morning and and having gone through everything that we've gone through, we've seen God be faithful. But I know that every morning, maybe every Sunday morning, every week, you might just be carrying something. You might be coming in with something just just weighing on you. And I just want us to remember the full gospel, right? That nothing that we could ever do, could ever save us, that nothing that we can strive towards would ever supersede the work of Jesus that was on the cross. And so I just, my, my prayer and my encouragement for you is whatever you're carrying this morning, just to let it go. It's just to give it to God and say, I can't carry this anymore. Like, I need you to, I need your help, Lord. And I just want you to remember those words that the battle is not yours, it's God's. We don't battle against flesh and blood, we battle against the spiritual forces around us. And so maybe that's just your, uh, just your release this morning, just to say, God, I just, I can't do this without you. I want you to fight this fight for me. And so we're gonna sing a song, a new song this morning. It's, it's actually called Battle Belongs. And it's just this declaration that this, this fight doesn't have to be mine that I can do this with God and that I can submit this to God and that I'll fight it for me. And that's so comforting, it's so encouraging for me and hopefully it is for you too. So let's sing it together.
Jesus is nothing impossible for you. We believe it, church. everyone please grab a seat uh, thank you for being here today and it's just amazing to look out and it's, it feels kind of crowded today and uh, again every Sunday is just uh, a chance to be encouraged by one another so again if you're here um, in person or online thank you for participating uh, we have no shortage of opportunities to get connected so we want to talk about those today first uh, if you are new whether it's today or the past couple weeks there's a connection card uh, underneath your seater in front of you, if you want to fill that out, we'll get you on the email list. Someone will reach out to you uh, to let you know more about Heritage. Um, also, today we have a member class. So if you're interested in membership at Heritage and what that means, there's a class right after church and there will be lunch. So we encourage you to attend. We also have something cool that's coming up called dinner parties. And basically, uh, May 1st and May 14th are the dates we have so far. And these are chances for you if you're new or if you have been here for years and want to get to know more people. You can sign up online on the Heritage website and you're going to get together and have dinner and just hang out. About six to eight people together, really, you know, building community. So again, also, if you want to host, if you love cooking meals and uh, hosting people, we need you to sign up. So you can find all the details online. Uh, May 5th is coming up, and on that Wednesday night, we're doing a park hangout. We're doing a taco cart. Uh, we'll have a bunch of games. We're just hanging out just to kick off summer. Uh, I think it's the last night uh, after D3. So kids, families, f invite your friends, your neighbors, anybody. We're going to the park. We're going to eat tacos and hang out. I mean, there's nothing better. So again, if you want to do that, if you want to get involved with help and plan that, please see me after church. Uh, and finally, uh, crew... We're going to dismiss you. So fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, if you guys want to head out, you know your class. Or if you're new, you can check that out as well. Everyone in here, we'd love to have you just get up, say hi to someone for a little bit, and then we'll get started.
everyone. Could you have a seat? I'm going to be reading Matthew 19:30 through um, 20:16. But many who are first will be last, and last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for Daenerys a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he to them said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a Daenerys. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a Daenerys. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you gave them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for, for a Daenerys? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Thank you, Tracy. How many of you in this room have had the pleasure of working on a group project? This may have been when you were young, sometime in college, grad school. Maybe you get the chance to do this in your workplace now. Uh, one of the really interesting things about group projects is that you see people's personality types pop up really quickly. And a couple of those that you see come up right to the surface are the control freak, right? Person that you know is gonna do most of the work because grades are really important to them and they work really hard. You have the public speaker who invariably presents because everybody else in the group is terrified of public speaking. You have the person who's the critic who just shoots down every idea but doesn't actually contribute anything meaningful to the group. Then you have the person who is clueless, who absolutely contributes zero and just sits there like they don't even belong in the group but is always the person that gets called on, right? And then you have the procrastinator, the person that doesn't really contribute anything, and then the day of the presentation, you get an email from them at like three in the morning, like, hey, here's my stuff. Like, neat, thanks, right? Now, there's plenty of other dynamics that show up in the group, but those were the ones that popped up when I thought about that. And of that group, who hates the group project the most? Anybody? Yeah. The control freak, right? The first one, because they know they're gonna do the lion's share of the work, and then they're lumped in with this other group of people that don't care. And like I said, the teacher or whoever's asking questions, maybe it's the boss, goes to this person that is clueless and asks them a question, and the control freak is like, I know the answer, I know the answer, I know the answer, please call on me, why did you call on this person? And I have sympathy for that person because in every group I've ever been in, you can guess which person I was, right? The public speaker. People were like, I don't want to speak in front of people. I'm like, great, I will do that. And then I don't have to do any of the other work. So just tell me what to say and I'll say it. And it was good because you stayed in the good graces of the control freak. You didn't want to be on the wrong side of that person because that dynamic got a little bit ugly a lot of times. And... I started thinking about this and I thought, you know, it's so funny how quickly our innate sense of justice comes out in a group project. Like, even when I was just sharing this piece with you, the control freaks in the room were like, oh, I hate that. It's so unfair, right? It's so unfair. 
and the lazy person, the procrastinator, are sitting in here like, I love group projects. <laughs> Those were great. I don't know what you're talking about. And I started thinking about this sense of justice and where this comes from. What's fair? What's not fair? And uh, last week, I got an up-close-and-personal view. I volunteered in toddlers last week because we're still a little bit short on people volunteering. And uh, Mary and I were in there, and our kids are in there, right? So this is not a judgment on anybody else's toddler that was in there because my kid and Mary's kid were fully a part of this. But what happens when you introduce a group of toddlers into a room full of stuff that is not theirs? What's the first thing that happens within five seconds of them being in that room? Dibs, mine, right? Everything becomes mine. I look at it, I want it, it's mine. You have it and I want it, it's mine. If I played with it and I left it alone for 25 minutes, but then I want it again, it's mine, right? And so I laughed because as we're going through the day, you have each kid taking their turn crying about some horrible injustice that's happened to them. And bless Katie Marks, our service coordinator, she looks through the window at Mary and I a couple times. She's like, you guys good? We're like, yeah, we're learning to share. We're good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. But I started thinking about this, and that this, this happens as toddlers, but it doesn't really leave us, does it? We still have this distorted sense of what is just and what is right and what belongs to me and what doesn't belong to other people. And I started thinking through this of, we do this to God a lot. We look to God as if he owes us something. And this parable really gets at the heart of that. It digs into this really ugly part of us that we don't want to admit is there, this selfishness that we have of things that belong to God, that we believe belong to us, that we want to hold on to or that we want to jockey for position for. But God is going to challenge that this morning. And so I'm going to jump into this text, but before I do that, I want to pray. So would you guys pray with me? King Jesus, uh, Lord, we acknowledge uh, that everything belongs to you. Lord, in the beginning, you spoke all of this into existence. You sustain this. You uphold this with your righteous right hand. God, you uh, are so gracious to allow us to inhabit your earth and to enjoy the many blessings and the many good things that you have given us. But Lord, I pray that we don't ever mistake your generosity and your goodness for something that is optional for us, that we can opt into and opt out of, that we can demand things of you, that we can uh, place unfair burdens on you. Lord, you carried the cross up to Calvary. You died for our sins. And that's something that I hope never loses its gravity in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the challenge that came to me as I prepared this week, as I thought through uh, the implications of this, as you challenged me in my own thinking uh, through this, and I pray that that communicates. Lord, I pray that there is nothing of me in this this morning, that this is strictly about you, is about your word, and is a way to uh, have this take root in our lives. God, if there are things in me, help those to fall on deaf ears. Help us to just truly immerse ourselves and be challenged and changed and perfected by your word. Jesus, we thank you again for this morning. Pray that you would go with us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So our text this morning comes on the heels of this interaction that Jesus has with the rich young ruler and then with Peter and the disciples. So Jason taught on this last week with the rich young ruler, and then there's this interaction that's really interesting. At the end of chapter 19, in verse 27, he's talking with Peter, and Peter said, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Now this is a question that all of us ask at one point or another. But essentially what Peter's asking is, is it worth it to follow you? Is what I'm giving up, are the things that I'm foregoing in order to follow you truly worth it? And if you think through the implications of this question or you go a level deeper, what he's genuinely asking is, if I am foregoing the things in my life, is it worth it? Is the new heavens, the new earth, the life that you promise us, is that as good or better than what I have available to me. It's a value proposition, right? He's counting the cost. But when you think about that, you say, okay, Jesus is telling us that there is a new heavens, there is a new earth where there will be no death, there will be no suffering, there will be no tears. Sin will be no more. He will be fully present all the time. And the question is, is it worth it? 
God, is it worth it? Now, I think that's a, a natural question for us because by nature, we are what are called hedonists. We seek pleasure and we avoid pain. We go for things that feel good and we ignore those things that bring us pain. But what Jesus is promising us is not all of the things that bring us pleasure. And he does not tell us that we are going to avoid pain. He tells us that we are going to take up our cross daily and follow him. We are going to have to forego the pleasures of this world to inherit this eternal life. And so it's a challenge for us because this started all the way back in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, there's this lie that the devil is telling to Adam where he's basically trying to get Adam to believe that God is holding out on him, that there is something better than what God has offered. He is in Eden. He is in paradise. He is in this perfect place, and the devil promises him more. If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. It's that ultimate lie that we can be like the creator, but I don't know how many of you have tried to speak things into existence, like breathing out like, hey, I want a mountain to climb right now. I'm going to try and speak that into existence. It doesn't work, right? God is bigger than us. He has abilities that we don't have. And what I want us to remember is that God is not holding out on you. God genuinely loves you. He has great things, and he has provided so many wonderful blessings in the midst of our lives here. When you look around creation, there are common graces that are available to everybody. Mountains being one of them, sunshine being another. Living in Arizona during the springtime is another, right? It's available to everybody, and like six million people take advantage of it, which seems like a shame. But I need us to remember that our purpose is not to seek our own pleasure, but God's glory. Our purpose here is not to seek our pleasure in the midst of all these things. It's not to be hedonist. It is to seek God's glory. And Jesus gives Peter an answer at the end of chapter 19, and then he parlays into chapter 20, where he finishes this section with many who are first will be last, and then at the end of the text, he brings it back again. Now, the answer that he gives Peter at the end of 19 is interesting because he says, yes, essentially it's going to be worth it. Here's the deal that I'm going to give you for following me. You will get a hundredfold of anything that you've given up. You'll get eternal life. You'll get to sit on a throne, and you'll get to judge the 12 nations of Israel. So I think most people in this room would probably take that deal, right? You give me a dollar, I'll give you a hundred back. I'll also give you a throne to sit on, which you get to judge people from, sounds pretty great, and eternal life, right? Sweetheart deal. You're never going to get a better one. But what he says from here is this transition point. It's this pivot point in the text, and then he goes on to bookend this at the end. He says, many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, for most of us, this feels backwards, right? We grew up in America. We grew up with the theology of Ricky Bobby, not with Jesus, that if you're not first, you're last, right? And we try to cling to this, and we think about, all right, if I am first, then I am first, right? Not last. I don't, I don't think you understand Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, those who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first. And he goes on to talk about the kingdom of heaven, and what he's trying to get us to understand is that the kingdom of heaven is very different than this earthly kingdom, than the rules and the things that you see situated in the way that we live. And so he starts off chapter 20 by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. This is one of 10 times in Matthew that he uses this, and he compares it in this instance to laborers in a vineyard. And I'm just going to break down the component parts of this parable so that you can see what he's talking about. So the vineyard in this parable is the kingdom of God. The landowner is God the Father, the foreman is Jesus, the laborers are believers, the denarius, which was this monetary thing, is a day's worth of money, right? So these are day laborers that he's hiring. This is a day's worth of money, is the denarius. That is eternal life. The workday is believer's lifetime in service to God, and the evening is eternity, okay? So this is our breakdown, and you can keep this up here for a little bit, just so we have a framework of what we're talking about in this parable. Remember that parables are a teaching tool that Jesus uses. He compares something to something else so that we can get a grasp on it. He uses stories in order to enlighten us, to make it easier for us to understand. He doesn't come straight out and tell us some of these things because they would hurt our feelings. Now, in the beginning of the story, we see the master of the house, who we just established as God, going out into the market to find laborers. Okay? Now, right from the jump in this story, it's, this is a really important theological thing that I want us to get a hold of. God sovereignly initiates and accomplishes salvation. Okay? I want you to understand what I'm trying to say with this. 
God is going into the marketplace. He is finding the laborers, right? The believers in the story. So he is saying that he is the one going out. The laborers are not coming to him asking for work. He is going and seeking and finding them. And then you go to the end of the story when he pays them for the work that was done, right? This eternal life that they inherit as a result of that is also given by him. It's what he possesses to give away. He is the only one that can offer us eternal life. That is not something that we can earn on our own. Now, in this story, it talks about the workday. So to give you a context, the workday in ancient Israel went from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And when I was reading this, I laughed because I thought about my father-in-law right away. My father-in-law is one of the hardest working dudes that I've ever met. He started a business here like 20 years ago, and he always talks about when he hires people that he tells them, yeah, we work half days at high tech, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And like, it is like clockwork. Like anytime he talks about hiring somebody, he tells that joke. Like you can basically set the clock to it. He talks about hiring someone new. I'm like, he told the joke. Just give it a second. One, two, there it is. There it is. But that's his reality. He works 12 hour days most days. Like the dude just is always on the grind. And this is the expectation in ancient Israel. So in this workday, it's broken down like this. The first workers go out at 6 a.m. And then in this story, you see four other times that people go out. You see the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and then eventually the, the eleventh hour. So this is broken down where you have people going out at six, nine, noon, three, and then five. Those last workers went out with an hour left in the day. And the tension in the text exists between verse two and verse four. So starting in verse two, it says this. After agreeing with the laborers, this is the first laborers, for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. Whatever is right, I will give you. Whatever is just, I will give you. Whatever is fair, I will give you at the end of the day. Nobody complains, right? He makes an agreement with this first group. Every subsequent group, he tells them the same thing. You go into the vineyard, I will give you what is just, what is fair, what is right at the end of the day. Now, there is an expectation that is inherent in this work. It is that I will go out and work, and I will, get, I will get compensated for the work that I did. Even those at the 11th hour were still willing to go out for an hour's worth of work so that they could get something. Keep in mind, these are day laborers, right? They have to work in order to survive. They are working to get enough money to make it to the next day. And so when they go, that's the hope, is that they're getting enough food to buy, or enough money to buy food to survive for the next day and for their family to survive for the next day. Now, here's where the story gets interesting, okay? The day ends at 6 p.m. The master of the house tells the foreman to call them in and to begin to pay them. But he begins paying them in reverse order. And you can imagine being one of these workers that started at 6 a.m., and you are tired, you are beat down, and you're like, why are these people getting paid first? They were here for an hour. And you're like, all right, well, whatever. Now, imagine working in a vineyard. I think some of us kind of have a misconception of what working in a vineyard looks like. Maybe some of you think it's like this video. I'm going to show you here real quick. Eating international food, having wine tours and tasting, vineyard tours, seminars, arts and crafts. It's a lot of fun, a whole day. Stop. Oh, oh. So maybe your thought of a vineyard is this, right? Like it's stomping on grapes, it's fun music, we're talking about cheese plates, we're talking about all these fun things. But the reality of working in a vineyard is that it is backbreaking work. You probably feel a lot more like this lady in the back half of the video than you do in the front half. You're tired, you can't breathe, and you just want to go home and take a bath, right? So these guys are exhausted. This has been 12 hours of hard manual labor working in the vineyard, trying to get to the end of the day where they are going to get paid for what they want. Now, when the first people come up to get paid, these 11th hour workers, right? They've worked one hour and they receive a denarius. Now, initially you might get salty, but what the first workers are thinking of, well, if they get paid a denarius for working one hour, that becomes the new rate. A denarius an hour, not a denarius a day. So now I'm going to get 12 denarius for one day's work. I get two weeks worth of pay for one day's work. I'll take that. Like I'm in for that. But then in verses 10 through 12, we read this. 
Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. And I want to pause here to remember what we're talking about in this parable, to go back to the component pieces of what's happening so you can understand essentially what these laborers are saying. What they're saying is those who came to faith late in life are receiving the same inheritance as us, and that's not fair. God, it's not okay that you are saving people who did not put in as much work as I did. So this begs the question for those who have been laboring for a long time. Why work hard? Right? Why, why spend my entire life serving Jesus? Why not just be this 11th hour worker where I can live in sin? I can go on a prodigal season, and then right before I die, I can make my deathbed conversion and call it good. Well, there's a couple things that I'll say to you. The first is that we don't know the day or the hour, right? I had a couple college teammates that this was their perspective. They wanted to accept Jesus, but not yet. I want to live in sin. I want to do the things that I want to do before I accept Jesus. Because once I accept Jesus, the fun is over, right? My life essentially ends and I'm just biding my time until Jesus comes again. And it's such a small view of what it looks like to follow God, that God offers us a joy that is incomprehensible compared to anything that this world offers, that we're continually trying to pursue something to fill this void in our lives that we think is going to bring us joy only to come up empty. Now, I told them the same thing that I would tell you. If that's the route that you want to take, if you want to play Russian roulette and just think that you know when your day, when your hour is going to come, I'm going to tell you that's a very foolish choice. Because there's a very distinct chance that God is going to come at a time that we don't expect or that you're going to die at a time that you don't expect. Most people don't get to plan their deaths, right? Now, I'm going to quote from the famous theologian Joe Dirt, who said, is this where you want to be when Jesus comes back, right? If Jesus is sitting in the room with you, would you make the decisions that you're making? Because eventually, every thought you have, every action you take, every word that you say is going to be presented to you in the midst of this, right? We will give account for the things that we have said, the things that we have done, the way that we have lived. And it's important for us to understand that we need to be diligent in that, that our lives need to be lived quorum Deo. It's this perspective that we are living every day of our lives before the face of God. When you look at Psalm 139, he talks about how every thought that you have, he knows completely before it was ever on your mind. That every single day of your life was mapped out before you ever lived one. Before you ever took a single breath, God knew how many days you were going to live. He knows the number of hairs on your head. The intimacy that God has with you is so far beyond anything that we can grasp. Now, one of the interesting things in the story is you talk about the laborers in these different windows. And I started thinking through, all right, if the average person in the U.S. lives about 80 years, what does this break down to? And so I started thinking through who are in these categories of the first laborers, of the second, third, fourth, all the way through the fifth. And it basically breaks down to the way that Barna breaks it down. And Barna talks about how 86% of people come to faith in Jesus before the age of 15. So he's saying the vast majority of people are in this first group. Now, I did a little straw poll on Facebook just because I was curious. Like, do these statistics still hold up? Like, do people still come to faith early in life, or are there a lot of people coming to faith later in life? And it held true. About 90% of the people that I talked to about this came to faith in Jesus before they were 18 years old. So this is why we place such a huge emphasis on kids' ministry and on student ministries in churches, because this is the foundation that's set for the rest of these kids' lives, right? Right? Now, I know from my own story that I came to know Jesus at 12 and didn't really start following until 18, which I think is becoming this this more prevalent story of people heard about Jesus. They learned the truth, but they didn't understand or learn how to follow, or they weren't done being selfish yet until a certain stage later in life. But the foundation was set. The truth was planted. It was there, and it was ready. And there's a couple things with the laborers in the field that we have to understand, that part of the work of ministry, part of this work while we are here on earth that God has given us is to evangelize. It's to train, it's to equip, it's to disciple, it's to do the things that God has us to do in the field. And I want us to think about those as we think about this grumbling against God, the unjustness, the unfairness of this, because 
One of the things that's really interesting about the story is that every single time God went back to the market, there was people there. So it isn't you give up on people after they reach the age of 18, like, you know, you're raising up a kid and they're not following Jesus and then they go off to college and you're like, no, I did my best. Sorry, they're done. It doesn't matter if it's a coworker who you've been ministering to for 10, 15 years that hasn't come to know Jesus, or maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's an older family member. Nobody else in my family is following Jesus right now. That's a huge burden for me. The reality is I'm going to continue to go back. I'm going to trust that God is going to continue to go back, is going to continue to pull on them. And that's my hope, and I'm going to be faithful in the midst of that. But I want us to remember that there's going to be people coming to faith at every different stage of life, all the way from young kids, all the way up to people on their deathbed. And I want us to be invested in that, and I want us to celebrate when that happens, not to begrudge God's generosity in that. One of the sad statistics, and this, this is a little bit off point, it's not really the point of the text, but it was a burden that I felt in the midst of this, because one of the statistics I saw in here while I was reading uh, through some of Barna's stuff was he said that the average Christian, after five years of following Jesus, doesn't have significant relationships with people that don't know Jesus. I thought, man, that's so sad. And I started thinking, why does this happen? And I think in large measure, it's because we insulate ourselves. We're, we're, you know, using this text of like, we should be in the world, but not of the world, that the world is evil and we don't want it to penetrate our souls, but it's, it's this fear that we have. But I started looking at Jesus's life and his ministry and where he spent his time and what he did. And I've been reading through Luke in my personal time, and there's this, this passage in Luke that speaks really well to the life of Jesus. And it says, the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. When you look through Luke 15, it's these stories of all of these lost things that there is a seeking after, that there is a celebration when found. And my hope is that we are continuing to press into those places, that Jesus puts us on mission to continue to make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded us. And we need to continue to press into those places and press into those people who don't yet know Jesus. And like I said, that's not really the point of the text, but that was something that just gripped me and challenged me and, and convicted me this week was how much am I pressing into the lives of those who don't know Jesus in my life and how am I continuing to press on that? So I want to get back to the text. So the first workers had just grumbled against the, or against the owner. And this is his response, picking up in verse 13. He says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So God asked three really critical questions. And this is where the text is pointing this whole time. The first one, did you not agree with me? These first labors, did you not agree with me? Did we not make an agreement that you would work an entire day for one denarius? The second question, am I not allowed to do what I want with what belongs to me? And then the third question, do you begrudge my generosity? And I want to look at each of those three questions because it's important for us to understand what he's pushing at with this. So God refers to this guy as hetairos, which means friend, but it's more like, look, buddy, we came to an agreement. I didn't change the agreement. And it doesn't matter what these other people got. We had our own agreement. I said I would pay them what was fair, but that has nothing to do with you, with what you agreed to. So what happens in this text, right? There's this change where the person, this, this spokesman for this first group, is essentially accusing the landowner of being unjust or being unfair. But we have to remember that God is just in all of his dealings. He did not change. The expectation changed on him for something that he never agreed to do. And this is something that happens to us when our feelings are hurt or when we feel that something is unjust, right? Now, it's not to invalidate your feelings. It's not to say that your feelings are not important, but if your feelings ever lead you to believe that God is unjust or unfair or that he is evil or that he is cruel or that he's flat out wrong, then your feelings are leading you astray. What's happening in that moment is that you are then asking God to answer to you. 
rather than the other way around. Your feelings, you're saying, need to be justified in God's eyes rather than saying, God, my feelings are telling me something that is not true about you. What is the lie that I'm believing about you that I need to answer to rather than asking you to answer to my feelings and make me feel better about the unjust thing that I perceive in my mind? Now, think about the justice that God provides. I want us to think for a second on the deal that is provided, right? So for every single laborer, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So here's the deal. We believe. That's our part of the deal. We believe that Jesus is a Christ, that he came, that he died for our sins, and that by believing him, we can inherit eternal life. Our part is to believe. Jesus lives a perfect life, dies for our sins, is resurrected, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and then takes his righteousness, his perfect life, his perfect sinless life, and he imputes that righteousness to us, which means that he takes his righteousness off of himself and gives it to us so that we can have right standing before God. That's the deal that we get, and we're never going to get a better one. So why would we question God's justice in the midst of this? Why would we question whether God is being fair in the midst of this? Was that deal fair for Jesus? Not in the least, right? We are absolutely the beneficiaries of that deal. And so it's important for us to look at this and say, okay, that may not be unjust. So it takes us to the second question. And this might be even a little more cutting to our ego. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? It's a fair question, right? So what belongs to God? Let's just establish that. Well, Psalm 24, 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Translation, everything, right? He's spoken into existence. He upholds it. It all belongs to him. And I know that you guys are like me, or I'm just going to assume you are so that I feel better. The things that you have, you believe are yours, right? my car, my house, my kids, the clothes that I wear, the things that I like, these are all mine because I bought them with my money, right? And God's like, no, you bought them with my money and you use the skills that I gave you in creating you to earn those things. Like you own nothing. And so it's this reminder for us that not only did God give us everything, but he also upholds everything. Jason shared on Easter from Colossians 1. It's one of my favorite passages in all scripture. Verses 16 and 17 says this, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He's a little more critical to this equation than I am. I don't uphold the entire world. I don't keep this entire thing together. He is critical to this puzzle, and I am a beneficiary of anything that he has graced me with. This is part of the, the agreement that Britt and I had when we had kids. We said, we are stewards of God's children. As much as we love our kids and we love them with everything we have, they are not our kids. We get this opportunity to steward them just like we do everything else that God has given us in all of his creation. And we need to keep that view of anything we have as God's. And the last question is another difficult one. And keep in mind the context here. So he's talking to Peter and the disciples. And one of the things that Peter and the disciples struggle with, you'll see a little more of this next week, is this jockeying for position. It's trying to operate in the world systems to understand the way that things work. And so Peter had wanted the seat of authority. He had wanted to be valued for his service. He wanted to earn the things that he was going to get. But the question that's asked is, do you begrudge my generosity? And let me put this really bluntly, the way that this question actually translates. Are you not okay with me saving people that you don't think are worthy? Can you take a back seat in the kingdom? And this is a perspective that's really important because if you answer yes, it makes you sound like an awful person, right? And I'll just let you guys in on a secret. I've totally answered yes to this question. I hope I'm not alone just because I'm a horrible person and I don't like to be alone, but I actually do hope I'm alone in this in that 
when you say this, you are prejudging someone's right to be in the kingdom. Their worth to be in the kingdom. Their worth to be accepted by God, to be forgiven by God. You may look at somebody's life and say, they have lived an atrocious life. How is it that they receive the same inheritance that I do? And maybe you've never thought anything like that. But my hope is that when we think about people coming to faith in Jesus, no matter what their life has looked like before, no matter what it currently looks like, that we actually celebrate that genuinely, that we are excited about that, that we forego the system of this world that is telling us you have to be in first. You have to have a place of importance, of priority. And instead, look at the way that Jesus lived his life. Jesus lived his life as a servant. He washed feet. He gave himself up as a sacrifice for everybody. He didn't try and be powerful. He didn't try and overthrow Caesar. He submitted himself to a humiliating death so that we could live. And I was, again, thankful for how the Lord showed up for me in this. I was uh, doing some of my, my own personal time in the Word, and I told you I was reading through Luke. And in Luke chapter 7, there's this great interaction that Jesus has with Peter. He's talking to Peter, and he says, imagine there's a money lender who has two people that owe him money. One owes him 50 denarii, and the other owes him 500 denarii. If the money lender wipes those debts clean, who's going to love him more? And Peter answers rightly, he says, the one who's forgiven the larger debt. And the word that Jesus gives him is so beautiful here. In Luke 7, 47, he says, he who is forgiven little, loves little. And my hope is that we remember how great a debt we've been forgiven. So that we can be those who love much. Let us genuinely celebrate the salvation of every single person that comes to know Jesus in a real and meaningful way. Let us not grow weary in doing good. If you are laboring in the vineyard, don't worry about what other people are doing. Labor faithfully in the vineyard. Let us not begrudge the generosity of the Lord. God has given us more on an individual basis than we could ever ask or imagine. Let us not forget the incomprehensible grace that God has offered us through salvation. And finally, let us seek to be last rather than first, just as Jesus did. Let's pray. Jesus, there are so many good and convicting questions in the midst of this. And I pray that as we heard this, as we thought through this, as we pray through this in the week ahead, that you would bring these questions to mind. God, that we would not begrudge your generosity, that we would think through uh, what belongs to you and what does not belong to us, that we would remember to be stewards of all that you have given us. And Lord, I also pray that we remember the deal that we struck, that you offered us salvation in your son, and that that is far greater than anything we could ask or imagine, that our belief is all you require of us. And that as we live out our days, that we would be faithful workers in the vineyard. And we can celebrate those who come into the kingdom. Jesus, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, for your love, for your grace. It's your son's name we pray. All your people said. All right, during uh, this next little bit, we're going to have the ushers come forward, and they're going to pass out the communion elements. And uh, if you want to receive communion, you can just hold your hands out. Uh, if you want to um, not partake this morning, you can just bow your head or keep your hands folded. And I'm going to come back up here uh, in a few minutes, and we'll receive those together before we close in worship.
on the night that he was betrayed with his disciples. He took the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's take and eat. After the meal, I told them that this cup represents the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take together. And Jesus said, as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. We're going to close with a few more songs. If you guys want to stand, we'll worship together. Throw 
out service, one of the things we like to do here at Heritage is just send you out with a benediction and a blessing for the week. And if you want to be a part of that, I just ask that you raise your hand in the air. Uh, this week, uh, one of the convictions that God laid on me in the midst of this was just to be thankful for the things that he has given. And so my prayer for us this week is that as we go out, we are looking actively for the things that God has blessed us with. And Pastor Jason shared uh, with a group of us this morning just this picture from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where he tells Abraham that I have blessed you so that you may bless many nations. And so my hope for us this week is that we look at the things that God has blessed us with. We look at the things that he has given us and we actively seek to go and be a blessing with those things. And that we celebrate when God uses the good things that he has given us to bring other people to himself. Amen? Amen. Y'all have a great week.